Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. I'd like to continue with our series regarding a book that we have called Who Gave the World the Bible? Uh, the subtitle, the canon. Why do we have the books we now do have in the Bible? Now, you can see this is just a mock-up copy because we haven't gone through the printing process yet and a little bit of editing still is going to be done. But basically, this book is free at www.ccog.org. That's ccog.org. Go to the literature tab, books and booklets, and you can find it. And it's, it's free. And today I'd like to talk about what language the New Testament was written in. We've gone over the Old Testament, and the Old Testament was written in uh, Hebrew, probably originally in some type of a proto-Hebrew or proto-Canaanite language, uh, then uh, Hebrew. Uh, there's a little bit of it in Aramaic, but hard, not very much. But predominantly it was written in Hebrew. But what about the New Testament? And there's been some controversy, which I think is unnecessary controversy, but there's been a lot of controversy among some regarding uh, the language of the, the New Testament. The document and linguistic evidence that uh, we've looked over, or various scholars have looked over, have concluded that the language was Greek. And while Jews were reached with the gospel, the book of Acts itself repeatedly points out that many Greeks listened and believed. And you can, I'm not going to read these particular passages, but if you go to Acts 14, uh, 1, you'll see that, Acts 17, 4, 17, 12, 18, 4, chapter 19, verse 10, chapter 19, verse 17, uh, 20, verse 21, you can see that. Now, scholars of ancient Koine Greek, or common Greek, have consistently concluded that the literary quality of the Greek of the New Testament books, including Matthew and Mark, uh, point to Greek being the original language and not a translation. But some people have claimed that the Greek is actually a translation from either Aramaic or Hebrew. Now, the ancient Aramaic language originated among the Arameans in northern Syria and became widely used under the Assyrians. As I've mentioned before, while the Old Testament was almost exclusively written in Hebrew, there are a few passages in the Old Testament that were written in Aramaic. Generally recognized Aramaic passages in the Old Testament include Genesis thirty one forty seven, Ezra chapter four verse eight through Ezra chapter six verse eighteen. So it's a fair big chunk. Also Ezra chapter seven verses twelve through twenty six, uh, Job thirty six two a and Psalm twelve verse two. Excuse me, excuse me Psalm two verse twelve. There are two other question places that have also been proposed, but possibly one word each. For example, in Genesis 15.1 and in Numbers 23.10. Now, we're, it's presumed that Ezra, the scribe who's got a book named after him from the Old Testament, is the one who made these particular edits for clarity. As I mentioned before, one of the reasons that Ezra would have edited the Bible was not to improve it, and you can't improve God's word, but because it's pretty clear that whatever Moses wrote in was probably proto-Hebrew or proto-Canaanite. It wasn't the same as the, the language by the time of Ezra, that Ezra made some clarifications so people would understand. And the same thing happens in, in English. In an earlier sermon, I held up something from the original King James Version of the Bible. And, uh, for example, the word Passover is spelled Badulur. And if you know what they're talking about, you know what it means. But in modern times, we don't spell Passover with two Fs, for example. And so modern editors have cleared that up. As a matter of fact, if you have an old King James Version of the Bible, you'll see, for example, the word Passover is spelled P-A-S-S-O-V-E-R, as opposed to uh, with a couple of F's in it. 
And, but it wasn't just that. There are a bunch of other terms we don't use in modern English anymore. We don't typically say ye or thou or uh, shalt. Uh, there's some other expressions. Basically, the same thing happened with the Hebrew language as well. So Ezra made some clarifications, and again, may have used a, uh, an Aramaic word a couple of places for clarity. Now, various ones have said that the relationship between Hebrew and Aramaic is similar, for example, to the relationship between Spanish and Portuguese. Now, both are distinct languages, but sufficiently related that the reader of one can pretty much understand uh, much of the other one. Now, let's talk about Spanish and Portuguese for a, a second. Um, I visited a place called uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, in the past, and in Spanish you would say uh, Rio de, de Janeiro, de Janeiro. But in Portuguese, the same word, now if you could read it, so a Portuguese person, a Spanish person could read it and know what it is, but in Portuguese it's actually pronounced Rio de Janeiro because their first R is pronounced like an H. Uh, D can have a J sound. And O's at the end of the word, in Portuguese, have an U sound, a U sound. So, again, that's kind of the reality that when it comes to reading it, it's easier for Spanish people to read Portuguese than to hear it, generally speaking. And again, there are some similarities between Hebrew and Aramaic. They were not exactly the same, but there are similarities. Now, some claim that the New Testament was originally written in uh, Aramaic. It's been stated, that's the stated position of something called the Assyrian uh, uh, Church of the East. It's basically that Syriac uh, Peshitta, which is a, a Bible version which is written in a vernacular or common form of Aramaic, used in that church they claim that's the original New Testament. For example, the uh, late patriarch she, Shimun 23 Eshai of the Assyrian Church of the East declared in 1957, with reference to the originality of the Peshitta text, as the patriarch and head of the Holy Apostolic and Catholic Church of the East, we wish to state that the Church of the East received the scriptures from the hands of the blessed apostles themselves in the Aramaic original, the language spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and that the Peshitta is the text of the Church of the East which has come down from biblical times without any change or revision. Now that's the claim. Now, the basic claim that advocates of this tend to make is that Jesus and others in Judea spoke Aramaic. Uh, therefore, and because they say some translations into the Greek don't seem to be logical, that the disciples didn't know Greek, therefore the entire New Testament was written in Aramaic. But there's lots of problems with that. One is, Jesus spoke Semitic Aramaic, sometimes called Jewish-Palestinian Aramaic. Not the same form of Aramaic that's used in the Peshitta text, the, the Syrian text. Jesus also spoke Hebrew and had some knowledge of Greek. Now, the earliest New Testament manuscripts that we know of are in Greek. Uh, Ryland's... Uh, Uh, the Library of Papyrus P52 is from uh, 90 to 125 uh, AD, with being written about 100 is considered to be the most likely date. Now that is, by the way, what's shown at the cover of our book here that I held up, Who Gave the World the Bible. This is the oldest known verified fragment of the New Testament. There's an argument that there's some pieces of something from the book of Mark that may be earlier, and that may well be true. But when I started work, writing this book years ago, they said within a year or so they were going to release all of this, and uh, it has not happened. Uh, there's still some questions about it. But anyway, you hold this up. This is written in Greek. 
I don't know how many of you uh, uh, could read Greek. Uh, I can, not super, super well, but I can actually read Greek, and this is actually Greek. And so, if the New Testament hadn't been written in Greek, as uh, some claim, it was pretty quickly communicated in Greek because this papyrus P52 predates the earliest manuscripts uh, uh, that have been found in uh, Hebrew or Aramaic. Now there's another early manuscript called Papyrus 66 or P66. It's been claimed from, to be from the early to mid second century. So, you know, maybe from 100 to 150 AD. And others have other views. It contains much of the Gospel of John and that uses Greek abbreviations for certain names. P66 often abbreviates the names of the Father, God, and Jesus Christ to two or three letters, which the last letter changes according to the grammatical use with the name, and it's highlighted with a line over the abbreviation. And so let me read something about this. Jesus is abbreviated as, uh, we'll call it I-N, a translated in, uh, transliterated in English as J or Y. Christ is abbreviated as X. It looks like a P, but it's a, a row, uh, is the letter in uh, Greek, to make the sound cr. The word God is recorded as a theta with a dash, while Father is shown as, see it's a pi, P-R, pi rho, and Lord as uh, a, basically a K. These abbreviations clearly derive from the Greek terms and not the Hebrew. Okay? So, the early abbreviations for Father, God, and Jesus, and Christ were Greek. Not Aramaic, not Hebrew. Now, I personally reviewed photographs of this P66, and I saw these names in it. And those abbreviated names are in Greek. Uh, I couldn't get a picture of it that I could legally use for our book, so it's, that part's not in there. Now, there's also something else called uh, P137, and you won't be able to see it very well, but it is in our book here. And this is from uh, the book of Mark, uh, Mark chapter uh, uh, 1, uh, verses 7 through 9, as well as verses 16 to 18. And it looks like it's from the latter half of the second century, so between 151 and uh, 200 uh, AD. Now, perhaps it should be mentioned that there are over 5,800 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek. The bulk of the original New Testament was written in Greek. Now, the overwhelming consensus of scholars is that the Old Testament of the uh, Peshitta, uh, the Aramaic part, was translated into Syriac from Hebrew, probably in the second century AD, and then the New Testament of the Peshitta was translated from the Greek. So I'll read something from uh, a scholar named S.P. Spock. Uh, the article is called The Bible in the Syriac Tradition. And this is from uh, St. Ephraim Ecumenical Research Institute from 1988. The Peshitta Old Testament was translated directly from the original Hebrew text and the the New Testament directly from the original Greek. Now, what's believed to be the oldest dated Peshitta manuscript is dated to 464 AD or CE. Now, the same source uh, for that claims that the New Testament was completed around 100 AD. And that's about when Ryland's Library Papyrus P52 was written, this piece. Okay. Now, a pro-Aramaic New Testament source has claimed that the Peshitta dates back to 175 at the very latest. Well, even if 175 is correct, it's simply not the original text, because it was the New Testament was finished before 100 AD. And 
And I should note that the, the, this book about this, making his Aramaic claims, very misleading. It tries to indicate uh, since the entire codices of Greek and Aramaic New Testaments that exist are similar ages, then the Peshitta is as old or older than the Greek, and hence is the oldest text. Yet documents like P52 shows that basic use in error. And there's also other problems with this Aramaic hypothesis. For one, the Aramaic New Testament didn't originally include all the books of the New Testament. The traditional New Testament of Peshitta only had 22 books. It was missing the second epistle of John, the third epistle of John, the second epistle of Peter, the epistle of Jude, and the book of Revelation. Now these missing books were later constructed, or reconstructed if you will, by a seriousist by the name of uh, John Gwynn uh, in 1893 and 1897 from alternative manuscripts. And, and included them in the United Bible Society's edition of 1905. Now, the modern Aramaic New Testament of 1997 has all 27 books. And, by the way, I have read the entire uh, English translation of the Aramaic New Testament. It's got English on one side and Aramaic on the other side. Rarely do I look at the Aramaic, but sometimes I have. But most of the time I'm looking at the translation. But anyway, the fact that the Aramaic New Testament originally did not have five books pretty much shows that they did not have chain of custody and it was not done that way. But that's not its only major flaw. Uh, scholars uh, Westcott and Hort noted that there were different forms of Aramaic and the Pachita form differed from the Jewish Aramaic, which they called Jerusalem Syriac. Now, I want to read something from Steve Caruso, who's a professional translator for 15 years, concerning the commonly claimed Aramaic Peshitta language of the New Testament. But before going further, before I read it, I want to point something out. I've had to deal with people who have claimed either the New Testament was written in Hebrew or the New Testament was originally written in uh, Aramaic, and they're just adamant about it. And when I try to bring up facts to them, it's bizarre. It's like, you have your scholars, we have ours. No, 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 no. There's truth and there's truth. The truth is, the Aramaic Bible, New Testament, originally did miss five books. And this is a wrong language. It was not the language that Jesus spoke. Okay? People can claim otherwise, but scholars all know this. So anyway... Let's read from what a professional Aramaic translator, Steve Crusoe, says about this. The wrong language. Many Peshitta primacy advocates claim that the Peshitta dates back to the first few centuries A.D. Since it's written in classical Syriac, and Syriac was spoken at that time, it seems logical that the text could be that old. The problem, however, is that not all Syriac is equal. Hmm? If the Peshitta was written right after Jesus' lifetime, one would expect the dialect to match up with the other inscriptions from the first few centuries. This particular dialect of Syriac is known as Old Syriac and is attested in about 80 different inscriptions. So what he's saying is if you go to the area Jesus was in around his time, you can look at 80 different inscriptions and they don't use the same type of Aramaic that th those who claim that Aramaic was the original use. Continuing, he wrote, So, when we compare the two, what we find are some very curious and telling differences. Peshitta, at the earliest, represents 4th century Syriac. It cannot be from the 1st or 2nd centuries, as some proponents claim. But I've had proponents say, Oh, well, you've got your scholars, we've got ours. No, if, it's not po if something's not possible, it didn't happen. Yes, I know we're in an age where people think they can pick and choose truth. But truth is still the truth. The truth is, it's no possible way that Aramaic was the original language that the New Testament was written in. Oh yeah, there's some Aramaic things that were translated, that's for sure. But the Bible itself, and like the book of Revelation, uh, uh, Acts and Luke, let's talk about those for half a second. Luke was Greek. 
He didn't write in Aramaic. Anyway, there's no possible way that a 4th century language was used to write a 1st century book. Now, be translated from it, but did not come out that way. And I'd like to read from a, a, another source. There are numerous dialects in Aramaic has continually changed over the centuries of its existence, with unique dialects in Palestine, Samaria, Galilee, etc. Odessa and Aramaic slash Eastern Aramaic differed from the Western dialects. There was also 100, 200 years time between the time of the apostles and the Syriac, which brought even more changes. Lamasa's Peshitta is inaccurate. Odessa, the focus of Syriac and its major New Testament versions, was not evangelized, much less established in Christianity until after 116, which is long after the New Testament had been written. Lamsa used unidentified Aramaic text to supply missing portions of the text he chose, and in some places merely copied from the King James Version. The forms of Aramaic he used are not the Aramaic of the time of Jesus. Aramaic spoken today, called the Eastern group of dialects, is different from the Aramaic spoken by Jesus Christ, which was the Western group, a branch that is considered extinct. Yet there are people, including people who claim to be in the Church of God, who cling to something that isn't possible. If it's not possible, it didn't happen. The Aramaic dialect used in Galilee during the time of Jesus was not the same as the dialect used in the Peshitta uh, New Testament. I want to read something from uh, Paul uh, Stevenson, who's a translator, editor, and linguist. And was Syriac the language of Jesus? Today you can find various books written in Syriac or teaching that Syriac or translated from Syriac in which the author claims it Aramaic, the language of Jesus. Well, it's true that Syriac is one of the many dialects of Aramaic and it's true that Jesus spoke Aramaic. However, sorry to burst any bubbles, Jesus did not speak Syriac. Jesus spoke a rather different dialect of Aramaic. It's also the fact that the New Testament makes it clear, sometimes as far as Aramaic goes, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. Peshitta says, About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, El, El, why have you forsaken me? The Greek says, About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus said the Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani in Aramaic. Okay, and that's why you get it, you see it twice in the Greek, but the Aramaic, the Peshitta has got a problem because it doesn't convey that correctly. Now the parallel verse is also in Mark uh, 15, 34. And from the Peshitta it says, And in the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, El, El, uh, Lama, Shavuotani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Greek says, In the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, Shavuotani, Shavuotani, which is interpreted, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But notice in the Aramaic they had to repeat this statement twice. But, but wait a second, that makes no sense. If it was written in Aramaic, they wouldn't have to translate it from the Aramaic to the Aramaic. Okay? But that's why the Greek did. The Greek decided, when God inspired Matthew and Mark to write what they just did, that I just read, they decided to put precisely what Jesus said in Aramaic and then translate it. But the Aramaic has a problem because they ran it, because they, obviously they took it from a Greek text that had both there. So this, my opinion, is proof from the Bible that disproves the uh, Aramaic hypothesis. It makes sense to have a Greek translation of Aramaic in a Greek text, but, may, but not the other way around, if Aramaic was the original language. Now the fact that Jesus was speaking in a version of Aramaic does account for some unusual translations, or seemingly unusual translations in the Greek, which people... Uh, pro-Aramaic people call bad idiom transfers. 
Uh, there are also poetry, grammatical issues, and split words. Now they point to this as proof that was, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. But that doesn't prove anything. The fact is that Greek was not the native language of the apostles, so you would expect some grammatical awkwardness. Now let's also go to Mark. Let's go to Mark chapter 5. Verse uh, 41, this is from New King James, so the Greek text, if you will. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Now from the Aramaic New Testament it says, and he took the hand of the girl and said to her, Talitha kumi, young girl, arise. Now why would Mark quote and translate from the Aramaic while leaving the Aramaic in? Because the account that he wrote was not originally written in Aramaic. I should also comment that the Aramaic English New Testament also doesn't properly handle 2 Corinthians 6, 2, and it gives, and it gives a misconception about salvation. And as far as salvation goes, there's a lot of misconceptions on that. We have a book called uh, Universal Offer of Salvation, which uh, clarifies a lot of things that you don't get clarified in the Aramaic. One proof that Aramaic supporters have given as to why it can be trusted is the assertion that Mark was in Egypt and he died in Alexandria in 63 AD. However, if you look at Mark's New Testament travels, it never has him anywhere near Alexandria. So the pro-Aramaic person was, is relying on a tradition that the Eastern Orthodox have that's not substantiated by the Bible or, or reality. And then the same author who did this tries to tie this in with Clement of uh, Alexandria, who was one who blended Gnosticism in with his version of Christianity. And see, he wasn't faithful, but they point to him. And now, some also claim it took centuries for the Greeks to catch up with the ending of Mark 16, 9 through 20. And supposedly the Aramaic originally had that. However, I did some more research on that. And I found that the, in the early 2nd century, people like Papias, who wrote around 110 AD, Justin, who wrote uh, between uh, 135 and 150 AD, and Irenaeus, more toward 180 AD, cited parts of the last portion of Mark, and they cited it in Greek. Now, Speaking of Papias, this is where his Aramaic supporters, they pointed to him that he made a comment related to the book of Matthew. Now, Papias did not say Matthew was written in Aramaic, but he actually said it was in Hebrew. The actual Greek words that uh, he used were used was, let me see if I can say this. This is in Greek. Ebrisi, which means Hebrew, and not Aro Mikey, which would be Aramaic. He did not write that Matthew was originally written in Aramaic. But some of the Aramaic people said, yeah, he wrote Hebrew, but he really meant Aramaic because he didn't know the difference. Okay? You've got to believe a lot of lies in order to believe that the New Testament was originally written in Aramaic. Now, I'm not saying there weren't any notes written in Aramaic and that somebody didn't use some stuff, but to to assert that the New Testament was originally written in Aramaic. The Aramaic that they used for the Peshitta was Jesus' original language and it never changed. It's just not true. Now, there's translation biases in uh, uh, many lands. And like uh, most biased translators of Greek, uh, the two uh, translations of the Syriac Aramaic that I've seen have both mistranslated John 14.17 and John 15.26. Uh, so let me just read these. Okay, John 14.17 says, He is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it's neither seen or known him, but you know him, for he, for he dwells in you, and he is in you. This is the Aramaic Bible in plain English. Now if you read from the Aramaic English New Testament, it says the spirit of truth, he 
who the world is not able to receive because it's not seen him, does not know him, but you know him for he dwells with you that he's in you. And now I'll, I'll read John 15, 26 from the Aramaic Bible, in plain English. But when the Redeemer of the curse comes, him whom I will send you from the presence of my Father, the Spirit of truth, he who proceeds from the presence of my Father, he shall testify concerning me. Now let me make it totally clear. The term spirit is not a masculine term in Aramaic. So anyone who thinks there's not biases in Aramaic translation, or the Aramaic version, they're in error. Spirit is a neuter term in Greek. And, it, and yes, it's been often improperly translated by most Greco-Roman Protestant scholars to the male gender in opposition to the wor rules of Greek grammar. But um, I'll give two correct translations. Here's one, John 14, 17 from the AFV. Even the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive because it perceives it not, nor knows it, but you know it because it dwells in you and shall be within you. Okay, neuter pronoun, that is correct. And here from John 15, 26, this is from the God's Word translation. The helper whom I will send you from the Father will come. This helper, the spirit of truth, who comes from the Father will declare the truth about me. And so, again, there are errors, bias in the Aramaic version, which is a translation. It's not the original. You know, translations are done by humans and subject to error. The Aramaic translation into English uh, are as well subject to error as those examples point out. Now, there's not, they're not the only ones who have biases. Uh, there was a recent Danish translation of the New Testament. It left out the word Israel 74 of the 75 times it's in the Greek. Why? Apparently to appease or to support certain Palestinian concerns. Now, the Communist Chinese Party has been looking at its own edited translation of Scripture to accomplish, uh, and let me uh, read uh, from a news report about this, to accomplish this goal, passages that have been ruled to violate the core socialist values of the uh, Communist Chinese, Chinese Communist Party would be removed from texts like the Bible and the Koran. End of quote. Now the Bible, Hebrews 4.12, says the word of God sharper than any two-edged sword. Ignoring parts of it doesn't change the truth. Scripture cannot be broken, John 10.35. And the word of uh, God, uh, no one's supposed to uh, add or take away from it. And you see that in Revelation uh, 22.18 and 19. Yet for political, theological, and other reasons, translators and others have tried to do so. Now, there are various ones who say there's all kinds of Greek text translations which disprove the idea that the New Testament was written in Greek. And uh, I've read the arguments and they're simply not proof. They're basically assertions or opinions. One of which was that certain words would not coincidentally be the same. And thus this so-called somewhat proves a Aramaic origin. Yet we see this clearly happening in the New Testament in Greek translation of the Old Testament, when the early church writers called it quote, the New Testament. We don't seem to have any early post-New Testament church writer who quoted Aramaic, unless they quoted a New Testament passage that had Aramaic in it. So if you look at early church history, and if, if people understood church history, they wouldn't be, most people would not be in the religion uh, that they are. We have a book on this uh, called The Continuing History of the Church of God, uh, I held up this book a moment ago as well, Universal Offer of Salvation. This book and our other books are available at the ccog.org website. I'm holding this particular book up as well, Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism. Why? Because we, the Continuing Church of God, are not Protestant. And if Protestants would look at church history and truly go by sola scriptura, like most claim, they would find they should not be Protestant, that the original church was Church of God, the original Christian church. And so the early church leaders and writers all wrote in Greek. Now, being raised Roman Catholic, I actually thought a lot of the writings, early writings were written in Latin. No, even according to the Roman Catholic Church, 
The father of Latin theology was a guy by the name of Tertullian uh, from Carthage. This is in Egypt. And he didn't start writing until around 190 AD. So this is like 100 years after the New Testament was written. And Roman Catholics, by the way, do not claim that early church writers were writing in Latin. They claim they were writing in Greek. We simply don't have a bunch of writings from church leaders in Aramaic. Why? Because the New Testament was written in Greek. Now, suppose this big proof uh, about why you can't trust the Greek it has to do with something called a quadruple word split, split word in Philemon 1.1. 1, 1. But again, there was no proof, just assertions. And I read this book's explanation, it wasn't proof. It's actually more logical to conclude that Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, wrote in Greek to the Greek-speaking uh, Philemon in Greek. The same source claims that uh, Greek text is in contradiction for Jesus' genealogy and that's supposedly resolved by the Aramaic. But Steve Crusoe, who I mentioned before, he also addressed that. So I'd like to uh, explain why that particular argument for the Peshitta, the slash Aramaic, is an error. Steve Crusoe writes, Hundreds of theologians have spilled rivers of ink taking on this apparent problem, trying to find different ways to harmonize it. But in the end, Matthew's genealogy only has 13 actual generations in its last set, rather than the 14 described. Now within the Peshitta, Peshitta, Peshitta primacy movement, the argument goes that in the Syriac Peshitta, the word for husband, or gavre, can mean guardian. Therefore, the Joseph listed here is Mary's father or legal guardian. This would make Mary the next generation of the list and round out the set of seven, excuse me, 14 evenly. Unfortunately, Gavra has no such meaning. So if you read this book, uh, this one's uh, probably by Lassiter's book, yeah, Lassiter's book, and you don't know Aramaic, you think, oh, he must know because he's saying it, but no, this Aramaic scholar is saying, no, that's not what that means. It says, Continuing, he says, there is not a single ancient lexographer in any dialect of Aramaic that attests to this, nor a single ancient Syriac-speaking theologian who's brought this possibility up, nor a single modern uh, lexicographer that attests to this meaning either. However, plenty of ancient sources attest the fact that Gavre in the relational context of a genealogy, exclusively means husband. Just like the word, uh, i got to look at this for a second, Ansara, Andra, does in Greek. Now as far as the genealogy issues, I'm going to give an explanation about this uh, before I go any further. This is uh, from a source called, the article, is there any is there an error in the counting of generations of Matthew chapter 1? In the listing of Jesus' forefathers, there is a name missing. Excluded from that list is Jehoiakim, otherwise known as Eliakim, who is Josiah's son and Zechariah's father, 1 Chronicles 3, 15, 16. The reason for his exclusion may be that he was a puppet king, given his rule by the Pharaoh of Egypt. The first phase the captivity of Judah by Babylon began with the end of Jeho Jeho Jehoiakim's reign prior to his son Jeconiah coming to power. Thus, the three groupings of 14 generations would include 1. Abraham to David. 2. Solomon to Jehoiakim. He's not mentioned, but he was among the first to be carried off to Babylon. 3. Jeho Jeconiah to Jesus. So in other words, said there were 14 generations, but uh, Matthew left out one person's name, probably because he was an improper king. So that doesn't mean, therefore, that the Aramaic is right and everything is better. There's no contradiction in the Greek text. Uh, there's also uh, another possible explanation uh, that's in Meyer's New Testament commentary. I'll list this. You won't be able to read it, but if you go to our book, you'll be able to find it says, in this third division, he's got three divisions here. The third division, we have to notice that 
In any case, Jesus also must be counted. Because Matthew 1.17 uh, says this in keeping with Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. If Jesus were not including an enumeration, we'd have a genealogy of Joseph. The final terminus must have said to be. So in other words, they're saying there's another way you could count this. Uh, if you uh, don't include that one king it was missed, that was missed. So either way, there, is a, uh, there are plausible explanations as to why we have this. Therefore, that's supposed to be one of the biggest proofs that Aramaic is right. But as I say, the Americas, it's impossible for the Aramaic to be it because Jesus did not speak Syriac Aramaic, which is what the Peshitta is written in. And we have no early documents to show the Aramaic. We just don't. There's another so-called Greek New Testament contradiction that Lasseter listed regarding treatment of eunuchs by the children of Israel in the church era. Uh, yet he's trying to apply certain parts of the Old Testament to the New Testament, which doesn't really apply. He also makes a claim because the New Testament says that Jeremiah spoke something, but it's written in Jack, Zechariah, and we don't find it written in Jeremiah. That's a contradiction. Well, if you check the Greek, one sees that the uh, Greek term transliterated as legontos in Matthew 27, 9 does not mean written. It said spoken. Jeremiah spoke something. It wasn't written down, but re later recorded by Zechariah. That is not a contradiction. Anyway, I did, I'm not right now in this uh, sermon going to try to rebut uh, more of Lassiter's improper assertions. We do have an article at the www.cogwriter.com website, that's C-O-G-W-R-I-T-E-R.com website, where I go into that in more depth than I do in, this, in our book uh, that I've held up. I think there's enough in this particular book that it disproves the Aramaic hypothesis or assertion. But if you want more uh, than, than in this book, again, I would recommend you go to the cogwriter.com website and look at that article, so I have more of that in there. Now, Lasseter also claims that something called conjunction usage is proof that the New Testament was not originally written in Greek. Uh, because he said the use of conjunction seems too consistent with Semitic, Semitic writings. However, since most of the writers of the New Testament had a version of Aramaic as their native language, it's reasonable to conclude that they have a Semitic bias in their use of Greek conjunctions. What, is, what do I mean by that? All right. In Greek, to, for an example, they use more definite articles. For example, in uh, John uh, 7, uh, 36 through 7, it talks about, uh, in English, we say the term, the last great day. Okay, But in Greek, the term is, the last, the great, the day. Okay, Now, if you were a Greek writer, you would probably put in more definite articles if you were writing in English. But if, for those who write English, we wouldn't put that in. Same thing with conjunctions, like and, but, or, or. Those are conjunctions. If you're used to using those in your language, and you're using another language, you might use them more often in the other language because that's the way you tend to think. It reminds me once, I heard, I heard somebody speaking. They had uh, they'd been studying Portuguese, and they didn't think they were so good at it because when they heard people speak Portuguese, it didn't make a lot of sense to them. Or to him, or her. It was a, it was a her, to her. I'm sorry, it was a woman I remember it was from. Anyway, she said that, so she heard this, she went to attend this lecture, and it was in Portuguese. And somebody spoke Portuguese. And it, for, it was a long lecture. And she's sitting there, and she understood the whole thing. She thought, great, I finally understand Portuguese. Turns out that the person who spoke in Portuguese was a native English speaker who had learned Portuguese. So when he spoke Portuguese, he probably pronounced some words a bit more like an English speaker would, probably used some grammar a bit more like an English speaker would, and so she understood it because she was a native English speaker as well. The same concept goes if you have somebody whose native language is Aramaic, and they're translating, they're writing in 
Greek, and maybe they don't know Greek you know, 100% perfect, because if it's not your native language, you probably don't know it 100% perfectly. And so they think, when they don't know what to do or think about grammar, they would tend to use uh, what they were used to. And again, that's why I told the story about the, the American woman hearing somebody's uh, lecture in Portuguese. And as I said before, getting back to the whole Aramaic, since uh, Jesus didn't speak in it, that type of Aramaic, so that eliminates their whole hypothesis. Yet there are people who prefer to believe a lie. And, you know, the Bible warns about that in 2 Thessalonians uh, 10, uh, 2 verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, as well as Revelation 22 verse 15. But the people want to believe a lie, and hopefully you're not among those who are that way, you're willing to believe the truth. And the truth is, the New Testament was written in, yes, Greek. But what about Hebrew? Now, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And scholars, and some other in Jesus' time, knew how to read Hebrew. But it's not likely that much, if any, of the New Testament was written in Hebrew. I'm going to go to read a little bit. You don't have to go there from Isaiah 28. I'm going to read part of verse 11. Isaiah prophesied, For with another tongue he will speak to this people. Okay? So another tongue. So you've got the Old Testament, which goes to about, uh, let's go to precisely where it goes. In my hand here. Take me a minute to get there. I didn't pre-mark it. Okay, so basically you've got, uh, this is the New Testament. This is basically the Old Testament in this particular Bible, which I use a lot, which is why the back index part just popped out. I'll put it back in there. So most of the uh, Bible was written in Hebrew. And the book of Isaiah was written in Hebrew. But the Bible says, Isaiah prophesied that with another tongue he will speak to this people. Now, of course, the Aramaic people may say, oh, that's because he's going to speak Aramaic. But, again, the New Testament was written in Greek. Now, there's something that speculated to once existed called Q. And Q's been claimed by some modern scholars uh, to include some facts and statements from Jesus. Either written in Hebrew or Aramaic, some claim that Matthew and Luke essentially use this, and maybe even Mark, to assist them in writing. Now, if such document existed, it no longer does, or we don't have it. We, we haven't seen it. All the earliest manuscripts we have of the New Testament are written in the Greek language. Now, let me uh, go to the uh, book of Acts. I want to go to Acts uh, 21, starting in verse 40. So you might want to follow along. This will be from the New King James translation. Acts 21, 40. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on his chairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. When they heard that he spoke to them in Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Paul spoke Greek. There's no reason to say that he spoke to them in Hebrew if all of the New Testament was already written in Hebrew. It doesn't make any sense. You say, but wouldn't Paul know Aramaic? Yes, but Paul was also a scholar. And the Old Testament books were written in Hebrew. Paul was trained in the Old Testament text in Hebrew. Jesus would read the Old Testament text in Hebrew. Yes, he spoke Aramaic, but he read it in Hebrew. Paul could do it as well. And here's another one. Uh, in Acts 26, verse 14. Here's this account from Paul. When we had all fallen on the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. 
So when Paul had his encounter with Jesus, uh, Jesus spoke in Hebrew. But if the, again, if the entire New Testament was written in Hebrew, there'd be no point in having to point this out. Yet there are people who insist that the New Testament was written in Hebrew. Now consider also that the Synoptic Gospels, that's the ones that say a lot of things, a lot of the same accounts of Jesus. This would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They have large overlaps in Greek. This would suggest that one or more of the Gospel writers had access to one or more of the other Gospels in Greek. Now that wouldn't preclude them, any one of them from originally been written in Hebrew or Aramaic. But it does show that they all were not, could not have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic originally. Now consider also that some of the Old Testament scripture quotations in the New Testament are identical to those found in some versions of the Greek Septuagint. This would not be the case if they were simply translated from Hebrew or Aramaic. Okay? It's just simply not the case. It wouldn't be the same. Now, it's possible that uh, at least part of the book of Hebrews was originally written in Hebrew. Uh, that's uh, Eusebius, a Roman Catholic uh, church supporter, or of Constantine. He was more, I guess, more Eastern Orthodox, but Roman Catholic in a sense as well. Eusebius wrote the following claim uh, from uh, Clement, uh, who's uh, from the second century from Egypt. He, he says that the epistle to the Hebrews is the work of Paul and it was written to the Hebrews in the Hebrew language. But Luke translated it carefully and published it for the Greeks. And hence the same style of expression is found in this epistle and in, in Acts. But he says that because of the words, Paul the apostle were probably not prefixed because in sending it to the Hebrews, who were prejudiced and suspicious of him, he wisely did not wish to repel them at the very beginning by giving his name. Now, me, before I go further, let me say this. Uh, yeah, by tradition, we think uh, the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrew, the books of Hebrews, because the Greek is different from the Greek in Paul's other writings. Some scholars say it's not possible that Paul wrote it. But if Paul did write at least a version of this in Hebrew, and then Luke translated it, it would make total sense that the Apostle Paul wrote it. Anyway, getting back to uh, what Eusebius wrote about Clement regarding the book of Hebrews. Farther on he says, But now, as the blessed presbyter said, since the Lord, being the apostle of the Almighty, was sent to the Hebrews, Paul, as sent to the Gentiles, on account of his modesty, did not subscribe himself an apostle of the Hebrews, through respect for the Lord and because... Being a herald, an apostle of Gentiles, he wrote to the Hebrews out of his superabundance. Anyway, if this account from Eusebius is accurate, it does explain, therefore, why the writing style in the, of the book of Hebrews that we have in Greek differs from the other epistles or letters from Paul. Now, some have claimed that because the New Testament writers often quoted from the uh, Greek Masoretic text as opposed to the, uh, from the Hebrew Masoretic text, thinking, what was I saying? Because the New Testament writers often quoted from the Hebrew Masoretic text as opposed to the Septuagint, which is a translation of that into, English, into Greek, that this proves a Hebrew or Aramaic origin of the New Testament, but it doesn't. I'd like to go over something from a Eastern Orthodox priest. Already two centuries before the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Jews living both in Palestine and those scattered throughout the Roman Empire found it necessary to have translations of the Hebrew Old Testament. This is because the Hebrew language, while still used in worship and perhaps in some rural villages, was no longer a widely spoken language. In the, in the synagogues, the scriptures were still read in the Hebrew original. Now, others agree that the scriptures were still read in the Hebrew original in the synagogues, and I believe that's what Jesus did when we read accounts of him 
in the New Testament, reading from the Bible. But the fact that the Old Testament scriptures were read in Hebrew at synagogue, Jesus' area, uh, would make uh, New Testament writers more familiar with those as opposed to the Greek Septuagint. Hence, it's natural that they would have translated from the Hebrew text. They would translate from what they remember or were comfortable with. Now, we don't have any truly ancient Hebrew New Testament documents. Some of those who assert that the New Testament was written in Hebrew claim, for example, this is because the Roman church destroyed, burnt them all. But that's mainly an assertion. Now, it's true that manuscripts got burnt, but it also included Greek ones, too. Now, Asia Minor was part of the Eastern Roman Empire. It makes no sense that for two-thirds of the New Testament written to Gentile churches to be in Aramaic or Hebrew. Okay, when you look at Paul's letters, you look at other writings, it just doesn't make sense. There are no Aramaic or Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament that we know of that compete with the uh, earliest Greek manuscripts of the uh, New Testament for chronological primacy. The Apostle Paul's ministry was to minister to the Gentiles according to Galatians 2.7. Greek was the Gentile language spoken and understood by many within the confines of the Roman Empire. Even the Latin generals and stuff they, and leaders, they would have learned Greek because it was a common tongue. Now, in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus told his followers to make disciples of all the nations and teach all things he commanded. Now, that necessitated using a language that people outside of Judea could understand. And back then, the primary language was Greek. It's kind of like it is English today. It's true, most people in the world do not understand English. But many people who have a second language, the language they understand is English. And having traveled around the world, uh, I was recently in the Middle East. I spoke English to everybody, uh, even though, uh, say, uh, some, uh, well, where I was last at, Arabic would have been a native language. Uh, the, the people that I had to talk to understood what I had to say perfectly well. Anyway, the New Testament was basically written in Greek, uh, not Hebrew, not Aramaic. As I mentioned before, uh, we have an article at the cogwriter.com website uh, that uh, goes into that in more depth. So now I'd like to kind of summarize some key points on the language of the New Testament. The earliest New Testament manuscripts that we have are in Greek. The Rylands P52 is from 90 to 125 AD, with 100, the apparently most likely date it was written, perhaps written. If it's a 90 AD, that would be astounding. There are no truly ancient New Testament manuscripts in Hebrew. Next point. An Aramaic New Testament was not around until later centuries with the Syriac dating to the 4th century. What seems to be the earliest Aramaic manuscript dates from 464 AD. But those at Jesus' time did not speak the form of Aramaic or Syriac, which the Aramaic translations are predominantly based upon. The reality of having to repeat certain statements twice in Aramaic as opposed to Aramaic and then the Greek translation. In places like Matthew uh, 27.46, Mark 15.34, I think that disproves the Aramaic hypothesis. It makes sense to have a Greek translation of Aramaic in a Greek text, but not the other way around. Well, what do I mean by that? Let me explain that before I go any further. I'm just going to summarize, but I have one other point. Many of you have heard the expression adios, Okay, so uh, let, let's say you have somebody says, he said adios, which in English is goodbye. Oh, excuse, me, excuse me, let me read it again, say it again. He says adios, which means goodbye. 
Now, you would not have written that in Spanish. You wouldn't say, he said adios, which means adios. Okay? And that's the problem that the Aramaic people have because basically they have, that, that's what goes on there. Yet, something written in English, it makes sense. He said adios. And, probably, and the person maybe literally said adios. In case people don't know Spanish, you say it means goodbye. All right. The fact of Jesus speaking in Aramaic and, and Greek not being the native language of most of the New Testament writers accounts for the seemingly unusual translations into Greek, the so-called bad idiom transfers that the Aramaic people uh, cling to. Scholars of ancient Greek have consistently concluded that the literary quality of the Greek, of the New Testament books, including Matthew and Mark, point to Greek being original and not a translation. I should also comment that the uh, Jews stopped using uh, YHWH, Yahweh, centuries before Jesus, and switched to uh, using the term Adonai, which means Lord. Uh, so that's another point that sometimes the, the Aramaic people bring up. Now this is also consistent with the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which uses the term Kyrios, or Lord, in the Greek. The Bible in the New Testament is absolutely clear that Luke and Paul knew Greek, Acts 21, verses 37 to 39. And we have other reasons to believe the other New Testament writers did as well. The fact is that Greek was the language used in the Eastern Roman Empire. Most of the books in the New Testament were written to those who were, were Greek-speaking Greek Gentiles in those areas. It would not be logical that uh, Aramaic or Hebrew would have been used as the original language when Jesus' followers were intended to reach the world with the gospel, according to Jesus, Matthew 24, 14, and to teach all things that he commanded, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Nearly all, at least 19 to 24 books of the New Testament were written to people in predominantly Greek-speaking areas. The vast bulk of post New Testament writings were written in Greek, and they also quoted the Greek New Testament. So if people don't want to believe uh, church history, they don't want to believe facts, if they want to cling to lies, then they can believe that the New Testament was, was originally written in, Ara in Syriac Aramaic, a language that Jesus didn't speak, because people didn't speak, and no early church writers uh, quoted in any, any length unless they quoted a few minor passages related to that in the uh, New Testament. So in conclusion, the Bible itself is reliable. Uh, it was, the New Testament was written in Greek. Don't fall for misinformation from people claiming to be scholars who give you misinformation about something that's impossible. It's impossible that the New Testament was originally all written in the type of Syriac Aramaic that people claim, or Hebrew. The historical record simply doesn't back this up. Again, for more information about the Bible, where we got it, and the books of it, I urge you to read our free online book, uh, Who Gave the World the Bible, available at www.ccog.org. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.